Why didn't you deny calling the president a moron? You know, that's a really old question. Do you understand that by not answering the question, some people thought you were confirming the story? I think I've answered the question. You think you answered the question? I've answered the question. Did you call the president a moron? I'm not going to dignify the question. Well, you remember that when Rex Tillerson refused to say whether or not he called Donald Trump a moron? Nancy Pelosi isn't nearly that shy when it comes to Kevin McCarthy. The mask mandate, Speaker Pelosi, any response to the backlash or the response? That's the, uh, that's the purview of the Capitol position, the official capacity, uh, mandate from him. I have nothing to say about that except we honor it. Leader McCarthy, Leader McCarthy says it's, it's against the science. She's loading. Such a so why did the House Speaker speak out? Because House Republicans are playing down COVID as it makes a comeback across the country. As far as the former president goes, he has so far failed to sabotage a bipartisan infrastructure plan that just cleared a major hurdle in Congress. Is Trump losing his grip on the GOP? Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe. It's Thursday, July 29th. Uh, it's good to have you all on board with us. Senators celebrated yesterday after finally coming to an agreement on a one trillion dollar bipartisan infrastructure bill. The breakthrough came after weeks of disagreements over sticking points such as public transit, uh, how to fund it and uh, all of that. Within hours of announcing the deal, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer moved to hold a procedural vote exactly one week after the previous vote failed. It passed with every Democrat and 17 Republicans, including Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, signing on. The deal still faces several obstacles to becoming law and needs to clear final votes in the closely divided Senate and House. President Biden celebrated the vote in a statement that reads in part, quote, this deal signals to the world that our democracy can function, deliver and do big things. Is, those are big things. Mick. In fact, uh, that's something that Donald Trump tried to do. For years, we heard about Infrastructure Week for yeah. years, oh, didn't right. we? Remember that? Uh, and, and he kept, he just couldn't do it. He was just incapable, kept coming up short. Yeah, he wasn't able to um, finalize an infrastructure deal. And no. as you mentioned, Infrastructure Week almost became a running joke uh, during his presidency. He repeatedly denounced the current bipartisan effort as a deal group closer. And in a statement released the same day, senators announced they reached a final deal. Trump called it, quote, a loser for the USA, a terrible deal. and makes Republicans look weak, foolish and huh. dumb. It shouldn't be done. It sets an easy glide path for Dems to then get beyond what anyone thought was possible in future legislation. Let's bring in White House reporter for the Associated Press, Jonathan Lemire, Washington editor for Aussie Media, Caddy Kay, and co-founder of Punchbowl News, Jake Sherman. Uh, first, um, uh, Jonathan Lemire, uh, very big news. And actually, when you saw that Mitch McConnell's name was attached, uh, that is uh, that's quite a move. Uh, if, you, if you look at the arc of this deal, uh, it's that's quite an accumulation of names to get 17 Republicans, including Mitch McConnell. I mean, you know, this this thing's bipartisan and it's going to make it through. Yeah, McConnell signing on, Joe, is a big deal. Uh, and obviously a number of Republicans followed suit more than I think a lot of observers uh, anticipated. And this is not just a token couple of Republicans. It's a big number. And it fulfills something that the White House has desperately wanted. President Biden, he campaigned as someone who could reach across the aisle. He is governed in a way where he has said repeatedly, uh, including to skeptics in his own party, saying, no, look, it's worth it. I can work with Republicans. I can get this done. And this is a landmark deal, the biggest infrastructure uh, investment in generations, uh, and certainly one that they are very happy about. Now, look, we're not all the way done, and we'll go through it, as I'm sure, as the morning goes along. There are plenty of twists and turns still ahead here. This is not signed, sealed, and delivered just yet. Uh, but it is significant. It's significant for this White House. It's significant for this president who said this is something they wanted to do. And I feel like a lot of Republicans can read some poll numbers. And infrastructure is very popular among voters of both parties. Uh, and this is a moment where they see something that they could make a deal on. Now, does this lead to a new era of good feelings and bipartisanship? 
That's highly unlikely. We're seeing it comes against the backdrop of real tension in the House of Representatives over mask mandates, uh, over the January 6th hearings that played out so emotionally this week. So this may be a one-shot deal. This idea of getting bipartisanship infrastructure program signed, sealed, and delivered. Uh, but it's a big step and one that the White House is really happy about. Uh, Caddy, and if you're a Republican senator and you're looking what's going on in the House the day before, uh, just absolutely disgraceful behavior by some Republicans uh, in the House, watching the testimony, the strong testimony of those uh, police officers who were beaten and brutalized by Donald Trump supporters. Uh, if you're going to make a bipartisan deal, the next day is a great way to change the subject. Uh, they came out, suddenly said that, hey, Looks like we're close to a deal. And if this bipartisan deal goes through, I mean, it'll be, I think, the biggest bipartisan bill in at least a decade. Yeah, I mean, if you want to look at what Republicans think works for them back in their voting districts, it's a pretty clear contrast, right? They didn't have the time to listen to the testimony of the officers up on Capitol Hill about the January the 6th hearing, but they do find a way, 17 of them, to cross the aisle and vote in favor of an infrastructure bill. It tells you all you need to know about where the American public is uh, in their eyes, that they need the infrastructure bill, but they don't think those January 6th hearings and what the officers had to say about January the 6th was good politics for them. Bridges, broadband, that's something that we knew the American public broadly supports. All of the poll numbers have said that. And this is a real turnaround for the White House. It was only, what, a month or so ago, um, Joe, that Democrats were getting really antsy in Washington. We, all we were hearing from Democrats was how long is the White House going to carry on negotiating? How long are they going to try and go for bipartisanship because it doesn't seem to be working for them? There was an enormous amount of frustration and a sense perhaps that the White House wasn't on the right track and had lost the, you know, lost the plot when it came to satisfying the progressive wing of the party. And yet now they've managed this is this was the Biden theory of the case. And this is what he said his presidency was going to be a about and, it and how many times did we hear progressives either in Congress or in the press telling Joe Biden he was stupid for thinking he could ever strike a bipartisan deal with Republicans? Well, like the little boy said at the end of the sixth sense to his mother in the car, every day, every day. I mean, it's all you heard, Jake Sherman. They're never going to do a deal with you. And now, now that Republicans have decided to strike a deal, uh, suddenly we have uh, a little bit of some skirmishes breaking out on the Democratic side between Kirsten Sinema and AOC. AOC, uh, after Kirsten Sinema uh, discussed having some problems with a $3.5 trillion price tag for uh, the next infrastructure bill, uh, AOC wrote this, good luck tanking your own party's investment on child care climate action and infrastructure while presuming you'll survive a three vote house margin, especially after choosing to exclude members of color from negotiations and calling that a bipartisan accomplishment. Jake, the uh, I've been saying that the uh, the progressives have have uh, held their fire for the most part through this process where Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin have taken uh, center court uh, almost exclusively. Uh, but yesterday, AOC laying down a marker before this bill goes to the House. Yeah, no. So a few a few thoughts here. Um, so the, this bill is not going to go to the House. It's not going to come up for a vote in the House probably until the fall. So uh, everybody in the House, all the progressives are going to calm their heels. And the reason why cinema is so crucial and mansion are so crucial is there is no democratic agenda without them. So what cinema was basically saying is that she won't vote for an eventual compromise. That's at $3.5 trillion, an eventual compromise, um, an eventual compromise of $3.5 trillion probably wouldn't pass the house anyway. So I, I think she's just, uh, expressing a reality, Joe, that, progressives haven't come to terms with yet. They don't have a 40-seat majority. They have a three-seat majority and a Republican minority that's not going to be cooperative on what we call a human infrastructure bill. So I, I, I think that, um, uh, you know, people are misreading this mandate. Yes, Democrats control Washington. They control all three bodies of governance, but they don't have a mandate in, in 
almost everybody in power's view to pass a four trillion dollar agenda. That's just not part. It's, you have to work with as You know, well, Joe, you have to work with the government you have, not the government you wish you had. And um, I, I think just one last thought here. I think the, the reason this compromise works so well is because of Portman and Cinema and Mansion. Rob Portman you served with him, Joe, as a serious of a legislator as as mm-hmm. probably in, in, there is in Congress. And again, without Manchin and Cinema, who were both in the room for these bipartisan talks, Joe Biden's agenda is going to be limited to executive actions. And again, the government you have, not the government you want. Yeah. So the, the Senate, obviously, it looks like it's going to pass in the Senate. The House has some time. Nancy Pelosi has some time to work with progressives and moderates there to figure out how to get the vote she needs there. And then as they move to the infrastructure bill, that's something that Democrats are going to have to sit down and work through with each other. They can do it if they can figure out how to get there. Mika, that'll be an extraordinary achievement, an extraordinary achievement. And again, it will it will justify everything that uh, Joe Biden has been saying Mm -hmm. uh, that he's been fighting for over the past six months. When people have told him to forget the Republicans, ignore the Republicans, they'll never agree with you with anything. Uh, Well, right now they've agreed with him on one of the largest infrastructure bills ever. Yeah, no, that's uh, that would be pretty amazing. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is blaming misinformation for low covid vaccination rates among, among Americans. The Kentucky Republican told Reuters yesterday, quote, there is bad advice out there. You know, apparently you see that all over the place. People practicing medicine without a license, giving bad advice. And that bad advice should be ignored. McConnell plans to run 60-second radio ads on more than 100 Kentucky radio stations in the coming days, promoting the vaccine with money from his re-election campaign. Not enough people are vaccinated, he said. So we're trying to get them to reconsider and get back on the path to get us to some level of herd immunity. Yeah, Jonathan Lemire, uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, people watching the show can have their laundry list of reasons for uh, being against Mitch McConnell politically. Mitch McConnell on the vaccine, though, has been very consistent, Mm -hmm. uh, just like he has been on on January 6th, as far as his views of what happened on that day, regardless of uh, what he did on the actual commission. But on vaccines, very consistent. And here, even taking the dramatic step of using his own campaign money to advertise in his home state, telling people, get vaccinated, get the rates of vaccinations up, stop listening to the lies, stop listening to the voodoo science, stop following your cult leaders. Yeah, Joe, I'm gonna use a sentence here that is not uttered very often on MSNBC Airways. Good for Mitch McConnell. This is something uh, that <laughs> yeah. is important, and he is, and he is doing it. And you're right. Uh, I think there are plenty of reasons politically to disagree with things that Mitch McConnell have done, and certainly people watching this network, uh, you know, let's start with the Supreme Court. Uh, but this is someone who has, he's been very consistent about this from day one, even though when other voices in the Republican Party were very quiet about vaccines. It's based on McConnell's, of course, brush with polio as a youth. Uh, he is someone who knows firsthand the importance of vaccines. He is someone who, from the early days of this pandemic, has suggested that people take appropriate safety measures. He would always wear a mask uh, on the Hill. And since the vaccine was developed, really was pushing his constituents and others to take it. Now, we've made a lot of, in the last week or two, a lot of Republicans and conservative voices sort of coming there at last and saying the same. And they, they, look, there's, they better late than never, whether it's Sarah Sanders or Steve Scalise or Sean Hannity, whoever it might be, other conservative voices are saying now, but frankly, McConnell's been saying this all along, get the vaccine. And to use campaign funds in order to take out these radio ads across Kentucky, a state with a lower vaccination rate, is a good thing. And let's hope that other political leaders continue to follow suit as the Delta variant just, you know, rips through a lot of communities across this country that are that have poor vaccination rates, even though we are seeing some hopeful signs that those rates are picking up here, even as cases continue to rise. Yeah, Jake Sherman, I'm curious. Uh, a lot of people asking me what, what's causing Sarah Sanders, what's causing some of these people that have never acted uh, responsibly in the past about this? What's causing some of these people to step out? Uh, uh, and, and of course, again, Mr. McConnell has been consistent on vaccines because 
of his brush with polio as a child. But some of these other Republicans that have not been responsible uh, suddenly changing uh, course. Are, are you hearing is, is there in, in you know, is there polling uh, that, that they're seeing? Why why the sudden move over the past week? Uh, well, I, I just th I think it's become painfully obvious that as a society, we're going to be paralyzed and anybody who's in power is going to be held responsible for people dying and being stuck in their homes and things of that nature. And, and people who say and I mean, I, I, I think there's I could tell you this. There's a growing frustration in the Capitol among Republicans uh, with people who are not getting vaccinated. The, the patience is running extraordinarily thin, both Republicans and Democrats. I mean, we did an event yesterday with Mark Warner, who basically basically said, like, you know, I'm, I've had it. You know, people have their individual choice, but there should be some consequence here. Now, um, I, I, I just think that the fringe of the Republican Party, and it is only the fringe, are people who are, are, are against this vaccine. And as you said, McConnell's been fully against this. He's running a, a six-figure campaign in Kentucky to get people get people vaccinated. Um, I just think it's become a moment where the, 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 the dam has broken, so to speak, and it's become painfully obvious yeah that they have to move, they have to change their tune on this. Well, well, what's painfully obvious, Joe, to continue to answer Jake's question for you is that the people who are getting sick and dying are unvaccinated and they're in the areas where conspiracy theories and Trump's sort of cult has taken over. And these are the people who are in these districts. And these are the Republicans who now have to change their tune because it's painfully obvious when their constituents are dying of the coronavirus and those who are vaccinated are not. And by, and by the way, here's some really simple advice for you. Uh, if you have a loved one uh, that is not vaccinated, that's listening to lies on Facebook, that's looking at bogus conspiracy theories on Facebook, that's spreading lies uh, that will kill people on Facebook, uh, are, are from other other news channels. Simple advice. Just ask them to please talk to their family doctor. Talk to their doctor that they've been with for decades. And chances are very good. 95, 96 percent of the doctors in America have taken the vaccine themselves. Chances are very good that doctor can try to talk them down. But it really is insane that we're in a situation in 2021 in 2021, where Caddy K, you will actually have people reading garbage from Chinese cults that have websites in America, and they will listen to Chinese religious cults and the websites that they run in America and get their medical advice that impacts their parents, their loved ones, their children, and will follow that advice instead of going to a family doctor and getting the facts and people are dying because of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it's taking a very few number of people. We know this from inside the US, right? The number of people who are on Facebook are spreading disinformation about vaccines is a dozen or so. You've also got a few people around the world who are taking advantage perhaps of divisions within the United States. We saw it in 2016 and we're seeing it again now over vaccines. Um, and it's easy to spread misinformation on Facebook. And yet you look at what's happening in some countries. You look at the UK, which is pretty close to herd immunity now, Joe. I mean, they're really talking about putting the pandemic in the rearview mirror now in the UK, with 87 percent of the UK having uh, antibodies to COVID. And that's because 60 percent of the United Kingdom people have been mm. vaccinated. If you can't get more people vaccinated, how do we get to the situation that now they're getting to in the UK where they can say, OK, we can lift all of those restrictions. We can lift travel restrictions. People are going to, you know, I don't want to go to one for two, but they're going to nightclubs. They're, they're doing all of the things they want to do because enough people have been vaccinated and then you add on to those the people that have either had COVID or have got some kind of antibodies from having had COVID already, we're getting there. I mean, it's really remarkable yeah. what's happening in the UK at the moment. And that's where America needs to get to. And we're not going to get there unless we can raise that number to 60 percent. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And by the way, Meek and I well, we gladly go to nightclubs. If the nightclubs were called Morrison's, yeah, it was a buffet. I can and we could be done by <laughs> 530 at night and, and be to sleep by seven. Yeah. Yes. Uh, every COVID death yeah. that is happening right now can be prevented, according to the U.S. Surgeon General. That's where we are. That is painfully obvious. Um, as we showed you at the top, 
The House is divided over reimposing mask mandates. The move to mask up comes at the recommendation of the chamber's physician, who said that people are required to wear face coverings again inside the chamber, office buildings, and in committee meetings. Minority leader Kevin McCarthy tweeted the return to masks is a decision, quote, conjured up by liberal government officials oh who God. want to continue to live in a perpetual pandemic state. He, he continued that criticism on the House floor, to which Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio responded. You know, if you read the CDC recommendation, said you only should wear the mask for the hot spots. I'm sure the gentlemen on the other side know which states and which cities are hot spots because those are the facts. You could see the facts. You could read the facts. You could understand the facts. So what is Washington? The vaccination rate for the members of Congress is over 85%. And as of today, the transmission rate on the Capitol campus is less than 1%. Well, the facts would tell us this isn't a hot spot. So the CDC recommendation doesn't apply to us. Look, the attending physician of the United States Capitol, the top doctor for Congress, asks us to put on masks when we come to a chamber with 435 people. I may not be from a hot spot. Speaker may not be from a hot spot. Speaker Pelosi may not be from a hot spot. Somebody in this chamber is coming from a hot spot. Somebody represents the hot spots. And they get in a plane and they fly here and they interact with all of us. I just find it absolutely immature and appalling to somehow diminish it to try to score cheap political points. And that's exactly what we saw a few minutes ago. That is beneath a minority leader of one of the major political parties in the United States of America, saying we should take no caution that someone from a hot spot, a hot spot is working in this chamber and could potentially get someone infected that could go home to a sick parent or an immune-compromised kid. That is beneath us. That is beneath us. It was so reckless. It was so reckless and so dumb of Kevin McCarthy. I wonder if, like Homer Simpson, after they cut the tape, if he tried to stick crayons up his nose. I mean, it's insane. Um, you know, um, Jake Sherman, uh, I had just said that, what are you doing? that have your uh, have your loved one talk to a physician that they know. And there you have Kevin McCarthy ignoring the advice of the attending physician, understanding that members in that chamber go back and forth. Uh, you know, members of Congress, uh, when I was in there, they still do. You fly back and forth to your district, you know, every three or four days a lot of times. And you're in your district and you're going to town hall meetings and you're going to events and you are surrounded by people. So, yes, for... The 100 or so members or 50 members that come from hot spots, there's a really good chance somebody's going to bring the Delta variant back into that chamber and pass it along and kill somebody or maybe have them go home and get somebody really sick in their family. It's, it's just not hard. And again, you wonder how low the Republican Party will go. You wonder how low Kevin McCarthy will go. Well, you ask the question, is Kevin McCarthy really that stupid? And Many would say that's a rhetorical question. I don't know, Jake. I won't make you answer that one. But talk about the back and forth you just saw between McCarthy and Ryan. Buried in what McCarthy said is that 65 members, all of Kevin's party, are not vaccinated. So 85 percent of the that's house unbelievable. is vaccinated. So that means 15 percent are not, which is roughly 60 something members of Congress um, who have either said something stupid, like don't talk like you're violating my HIPAA by asking me if I'm vaccinated. 
I wear a mask at the Capitol because I don't want to give it to my unvaccinated children. A lot of reporters do that. A lot of members do that. So not only are they coming from hotspots, they're traveling through airports like Dallas and Atlanta and Chicago and Denver, where there's a mix of people every couple days who are who could be carrying the virus. And like, so I just don't want my kids and my to get my unvaccinated children to get sick. And I think a lot of people feel that now there are big uh, bipartisan complaints about the attending physician who has not been forthcoming with information, who did not get tourists out of the Capitol quick enough, who has not been clear about why he's making some decisions. And those are all legitimate gripes with the attending physician. But with a uh, you have to be an idiot to not understand that the Delta variant is is raging here. And and there's just real risk for unvaccinated people. And all of us in the Capitol, many of us are around unvaccinated children. And just the the and listen, I, I I'm very frustrated by this. My patience with people who are putting me and my kids at not me, but my kids at risk is is really um, is really dwindling. And that's not a partisan issue for me. I. I just want people to just shut up and wear masks because I, well, um, I, I, yeah. I can't take I can't take the question yeah, from I, my I, wife anymore, who's being more responsible than me. But I just you know, it, this has been a problem since we got into this pandemic that people don't listen to to the advice of, of, of doctors. And I'll, I'll stop after this. I mean, we're not having a theoretical debate here. Like, I'm not a doctor. I could read the science, but if a doctor tells me to do something, like I'm going to do it even if it's inconvenient to me because we live in a society with other human beings and we have to be, you know, my wife sent me a uh, a photo the other day from a hotel in California that had an unvax a, a people who are anti-maskers and there was a sign that said look in this mirror if you're not wearing a mask cuz you're around the only person that you care about which I thought is a really good a really good example of just how stupid people yeah. are. And you know what? McCarthy, I, I'm not defending him here, but he has a conference full of people who don't believe in science, don't believe in medicine, and, and that's what he's representing here. Uh, and it's 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 disappointing to me and to people who are going to be around yeah. people yeah. who are susceptible to this virus. Well, and, and again, if they don't care about anybody else outside of their family, worry about their children, worry about other people's children, worry worry about their loved ones. As we had in a report from Dr. Dave earlier this week in Alabama, the emergency rooms, a uh, lot more children uh, this year uh, than there were last year with the Delta variant. We're, I'm hearing the same thing out of Florida, emergency rooms and hospitals, that the pediatric wards are, are uh, finding a lot more of an impact for younger children this year uh, than last year because of the Delta variant. So, Mika, yeah. there is so much at stake here. And, and, and I do expect more members, more members of the press getting angry about the fact that a lot of these jackasses are, are literally putting their children's lives in danger because they're trying to make a political point, a stupid political point, but a political point all the same. It's just like last year in the middle of a pandemic that killed over 600,000, that's killed over 600,000 people. I, uh, what was it? It was the, why, uh, Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, was making fun of, uh, Jake, it may have been you. You sure do look funny in that mask. Uh, making fun it of was like, me. This is just, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was you. The, like, to which this, Jake said, this we don't want to die. Well, and we don't Correct. want our children to end up in the hospital and we don't want our parents to die. And we don't want this is not hard, Mika. It's no. not hard. That's the thing. It's it's simple science. And um, what Kevin McCarthy is doing is malpractice. Um, it's it's endangering his constituents unnecessarily, their lives. Jake Sherman, thank you very much. Joining us now, founding director of the Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research, Dr. Nahid Badilia. She's an NBC News and MSNBC medical contributor. Let's just lay this out very simply. We had Dr. Anthony Fauci on the show earlier this week, and he talked about the dangers of the Delta variant, that the, the Delta variant, if it's allowed to really grow, 
um, it could mutate into other variants that could break through the vaccine, people who are vaccinated, that they could become mutations that become especially deadly. And this whole swirl of coronavirus could come back and, and rip across America. So we're trying to contain the Delta variant by getting more and more people vaccinated. But there are those who refuse to get vaccinated, which is why masking is happening. Am I correct? Also, where are the hot spots and why is the Delta variant killing so many people? Amika, I think Dr. Fauci is right. Every time a new infection happens with this coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, the virus gets a chance to evolve. And not all mutations are beneficial to it, but the longer this transmission goes on, you know, here globally, the more chances the virus has to evolve, as you said, to affect the efficacy of the vaccine. And so you might see new variants that could drop the efficacy a bit more than what we're seeing right now. The, the reason the Delta virus is, is affecting so many is that we know that this is a lot more transmissible variant that at first diagnosis, people who all get this infection have thousand times more virus. That means that they get sicker faster if, you know, if they're particularly if there's somebody who are vulnerable and they and have not been vaccinated and they're more likely to pass it on to other people. And that's the hot spots that are exactly, as you said, are places where people are unvaccinated. But what you're seeing in those settings is that when there is so much community transmission in an area, you're seeing some breakthrough infections in people who are vaccinated. And the newest part of this news, Mika, from, from Monday, from the CDC and the concern and the reason they uh, reintroduced the mask mandate is that what they've discovered is that in that, you know, again, vaccines protect you from severe disease, they protect you, they reduce your chances of getting infections, they reduce your chances of transmitting. But in the in the settings where you might get a breakthrough infections, it looks like the amount of virus is higher in people than, than it would have been in a virus that was in the community last year, which means that in high transmission areas, the vaccinated could in small numbers play a part in, in the, the chains of transmission. Again, majority of the transmission is happening by, you know, among people who are unvaccinated and majority of the burden is being carried by people who are unvaccinated. And that's why I actually think, uh, you know, a public health body that takes that evolving data and changes their stance, i rather take that than one that wants to, to stick with their guns, you know, in the face of changing data to keep us all safe. Doctor, I think it was last week that we had Scott Gottlieb um, on the program, and he was talking about how Delta, because it's so transmissible, as you're saying, could have the capacity to sweep very quickly through portions of the population vaccinated. Can you talk about that and what that might mean, um, you know, kind of almost for getting to herd immunity? It, Okay, well, overly optimistic okay. interpretation. Yeah, I, so I think there's two things that uh, Dr. Gottlieb says that I think are important. One is that I think he's right that there are probably a lot more infections in the community that we than we recognize because we aren't testing everybody. Right? There's a there's likely to be. Uh, some breakthrough infections among the vaccinated that we're not picking up because we haven't been testing asymptomatic vaccinated people, nor nor should we until we had this reason on Monday to say potentially some of them could be change the transmission. So you've seen this, I think, in places like India. You're, you're talking about the Caddy, you're talking about UK, about the rise. And so you might you're going to see it sweep through communities that are unvaccinated. Um, and, and, and you might see the, the cases go up and actually overwhelm the healthcare systems, particularly on those reasons. But you may see us getting to the other side of this, the other part, other side of sort of a peak faster, you know, of this. I think for, but that peak may be stretched out to the point where it finds more and more unvulnerable people in, in geographic areas, such as kids, you know, who until now have been at home. Uh, or unless they've been to summer camps and things like that. And so I think it's important that we focus on putting the non-pharmaceutical interventions in place so we can bring the cases down to the point where it is amenable for kids to be able to go back to school the way that we all want them to go to school come fall. All right, Dr. Naid Badilea, it's always great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on this morning. And still ahead on Morning Joe, new reporting on the lengths former President Trump went to in order to investigate false claims of election fraud, including almost daily calls. 
to his acting attorney general. Plus, with coronavirus cases surging, some companies are taking action. We'll take a look at which businesses are opting to require vaccinations for employees. And U.S. swimmer Caleb Dressel is bringing home the gold after setting a new Olympic record. An update on how he and the rest of the team are doing this morning. You're watching Morning Joe. We'll be right back. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. Woohoo! Well, I don't feel so good. Remember the feeling you got as a kid getting tucked into bed? Or the feeling you get now in the arms of somebody you love? Safe and secure. It's a feeling of security that only comes through a human connection. And that's why the people at Simply Safe Home Security are so important. Of course, Simply Safe has an award winning system that has all the technology bells and whistles you'd expect these days. But the people at Simply Safe really take it to the next level. They're there around the clock anytime you need them. Whether it's a fire, a burglary, a medical emergency, a burst pipe, or even a problem while you're setting up the system, Simply Safe has a person with the expertise you need ready to help 24 7. And when you know there's always someone there to help, well, that's a feeling you just don't get with any old security system. To find out how Simply Safe can help make you feel safe and secure at home, visit simplysafe.com slash dateline today to customize your system and get a free security camera. That's S I M P L I S A F E dot com slash dateline today. Our world is facing some big challenges. Chuck Todd breaks them down. A deep dive into a new topic. Instead of covering all the big stories, we're going to cover one single subject impacting American politics. Exploring and explaining the critical issues that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. All episodes of Season 2 are now available on demand on Peacock. Live shot out of Tokyo. It is 39 past the hour, and we have the latest from the Tokyo Olympic Games. When we left you yesterday morning, the U.S. women's three-on-three basketball team had just defeated France to advance to the title game, where they went on to defeat the Russian squad 18 to 15 and earn the first ever Olympic gold medal in the event. Wow, it was a big night in the pool as well for Team USA. Two-time reigning world champion Caleb Dressel swam to an Olympic record in the men's 100-meter freestyle, holding off Australia's Kyle Chalmers to take home the first individual gold medal of his career. Team USA is also celebrating a surprise victory in the inaugural men's 800-meter freestyle after Bobby Fink charged from fifth place in the final leg of the race to claim gold for the United States. China could not be caught in a record-setting women's 200-meter butterfly, but U.S. swimmers Reagan Smith and Haley Flickinger picked up the silver and the bronze. And Katie Ledecky powered the U.S. women's 4 by 200 meter freestyle relay team to silver, overtaking heavily favored Australia in her final leg to come within four tenths of a mm. second <clears throat> of the gold won by China's world record setting time. Amazing. The U.S. leads the world with 37 total medals, but trails Japan's 15 golds by two. Meanwhile, two-time reigning world pole vault champion Sam Kendricks will not represent the United States in Tokyo after testing positive for COVID-19. Heartbreaking. Kendrick's father confirmed the news yesterday in a since-deleted post on Instagram, writing, quote, officials informed Sam that his daily test for COVID-19 was positive, so he is out of Oh, how sad. I'm that is, Oh, my God. 
It comes as Japanese officials sound the alarm after two straight days of record-breaking coronavirus cases <clears throat> in Tokyo, which remains under a fourth state of emergency put in place on July 12th. The city recorded an all-time high yesterday as it exceeded 3,000 new infections for the first time. Jonathan Lemire, um, there have been God. some ups and downs, obviously, uh, during the Olympic Games, but uh, Team USA doing pretty darn well so far. You, you, you look at the success of those athletes, and I, I know we were, were focused uh, a lot of us uh, focused on one athlete, uh, but there's so many athletes uh, that have done so well, that have, have worked hard uh, and have gone for the gold and gotten it or the silver or the bronze. Uh, the United States really turning in a great performance in Tokyo. No, you're right. I mean, there have been a few big headlines and bold-faced names who have not quite performed like we would have expected. And certainly the USA men's basketball team took a loss in their first game. Uh, Kay Ledecky, oh. who's a legend, uh, but, you know, has settled, you know, finished silver, got a silver, won one other race, finished fifth. She also did win a gold and was certainly tremendous in the clip we just showed there. And, of course, we've talked a lot about the women's uh, gymnastics team. But it goes, it speaks to America's just depth and the size and the strength of its overall uh, team, its body of work, it's, it's the athletes from A to Z, uh, and how impressive they have ha they have been. They go into these Olympics as the heavy favorites, and even with a few somewhat surprising uh, <laughs> defeats, they're still racking up the medals. And I think most observers expect that they will, when the games are all uh, said and done, will end up with the highest number of total medals and the highest number of golds. And I will just say personally, it's been great fun. My two boys have, have eaten it up and watched you know e events from gymnastics to archery to Swimming, things they wouldn't encounter uh, in their normal day, which is mostly just a stress about how the Red Sox are doing. Well, exactly. <laughs> Fortunately, the Red Sox uh, coming through in the second uh, second uh, game of the doubleheader last night. And um, again, I can't figure out: do I cheer for the Yankees? Uh. Do I cheer for the 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 Rays? I mean, it's sort of like you know, it's, that's a, that's a hard one uh, when. When the Yankees are so far back. Um, so, uh, Caddy K, it, it is interesting, though, just for uh, younger people. And, of course, you're very young. I'm not suggesting you're not very young. But for some really young people that are watching these Olympic Games, you know, the, the medal count used to be spread out much more. You would have the Soviet Union, uh, China, Japan, Britain, the U.S., and there'd be more of a scramble up top. Uh, and then, of course, there were... Always the East German women swimmers and weightlifters that we were having to deal with throughout the 70s and part of the 80s. Uh, but uh, the, the Team USA, uh, despite, um, again, a lot of the ups and the downs over the past several weeks, doing very, very well right now. Yeah, doing super well in the in the overall medal count and number three in the gold medal count. And as Jonathan says, probably by the end of this, uh, it looks like that the Americans could be the top in both of those categories. Uh, look, the big the big difference, right, Joe? You're right to point to it was the fall of the Soviet Union. And in retrospect, some of the practices that were going on in the Soviet Union have still gone in in the Russian Federation, and which is why the Russian athletes keep getting into trouble around doping issues and the amount of steroids that have been used in the past amongst Russian, Russian athletes and Soviet athletes, and take them out of the picture and make it a much more level playing field. It's perhaps not surprising that the, the countries that are dominating the medal field are the countries with huge big populations and with well-developed resources that they are putting into athletic programs, and that's China and the United States. In a way, I think it's kind of a shame. I mean, it'd be nice to see smaller countries also able to break into that league. And, and you do see it actually more in the Winter Olympics. You see smaller companies. I remember when the last couple of Winter Olympics, it was Norway that dominated the Winter Olympics field. Um, and it, I think it's kind of fun. It's like in the World Cup in football, you know, when you see a team come out of Africa that goes a long way, much further than anyone had expected. I love those underdog moments that we get in, in yeah. global sports. We're not seeing them at the moment yet in the Olympics. We may do in individual sports, but I think that's what makes global sports so great. Well, I agree, except uh, one exception, when Iceland defeats England in uh, the Euro <laughs> okay. uh, Cup in 2016. Okay. That's the exception. But, yes, the Jamaican exception, yeah. bobsled team, <laughs> that stuff's good. And Jonathan O'Meara, though, it really does, though, what Caddy's talking 
Yes, yeah. Caddy, uh, uh, Caddy was talking about how uh, you see the really big countries with the big populations that have the money to invest really doing much better at the, the gold medal count. I will say that is one thing that's really different from, let's say, 20 years ago before uh, before we, we had the technology, before we had all the money that was poured into training day in and day out, year in and year out for all of these athletes, the richer the country, the bigger the country, the better chance uh, you have uh, to, to, to win a gold medal. Not, not a whole lot of Bulgarians uh, or uh, uh, people from smaller countries breaking through and winning gold medals in, uh, in swimming. No, Australia would have to count as a small country in this conversation. They, they've certainly done well in some of the swimming events. But you're right. It's, it's about technology. It's about resources. It's about equipment. And also, I think that the divide between the haves and the have-nots in this case, the bigger countries and the smaller ones, probably even more pronounced this year coming out of the pandemic, where you have more, more athletes vaccinated, let's say, from the American side than most other countries, where you have people who have been able to have probably more regular training routines in the months prior to the Olympics. I mean, Everyone, of course, had their training disrupted to at least some degree uh, by the virus. But I think the bigger countries with the resources, with the facilities, have probably been able to weather that storm a little better. Uh, and their athletes, you know, with a full postponement of the games for a year, their athletes have been better able to, to handle that. And we are seeing the U.S. and China uh, dominate things. And, of course, as one Olympic tradition that I always do enjoy, is that the host country always seems to do pretty well. Uh, and Japan has, has done so so far this year uh, with a number of golds already. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find out, Mika, if any Bulgarians have ever won any swimming events at the Olympics. I'll be, I'll be working on that for a while. Okay. Let's see, 1976. We'll I'm not sure. All right. We'll do that. And while you do that, I'm going to tease the next story. You do that. Coming up, the profanity list voicemail that police officer Michael Fanone received while he was testifying before Congress about the January 6th insurrection and what he and his colleagues went through, plus how Trumpists prey on loneliness and loneliness preys on Trumpists. Our next guest is analyzing the appeal of Donald Trump. Morning Joe is coming right back. Remember the feeling you got as a kid getting tucked into bed? Or the feeling you get now in the arms of somebody you love? Safe and secure. It's a feeling of security that only comes through a human connection. And that's why the people at Simply Safe Home Security are so important. Of course, Simply Safe has an award winning system that has all the technology bells and whistles you'd expect these days. But the people at Simply Safe really take it to the next level. They're there around the clock anytime you need them. Whether it's a fire, a burglary, a medical emergency, a burst pipe, or even a problem while you're setting up the system, Simply Safe has a person with the expertise you need ready to help 24 7. And when you know there's always someone there to help, well, that's a feeling you just don't get within the old security system. To find out how Simply Safe can help make you feel safe and secure at home, visit simplysafe.com slash dateline today to customize your system and get a free security camera. That's S I M P L I S A F E dot com slash dateline today. We owe a real debt to the men and women of the Capitol Police, D.C. Metro Police, National Guard, and other agencies who help secure and protect our workplace. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell with that clear praise of the Capitol Police. It's a message we didn't hear from some corners of far-right media after Tuesday's testimony of four officers who defended the Capitol against Trump rioters on January 6th. And it was while D.C. police officer Michael Fanone was testifying before the House Select Committee that a Trump supporter left a threatening voicemail laced with expletives. Here is part of the very disturbing message. Yeah, this is from Michael Fanone, Metropolitan Police Officer. You're on trial right now, lying and that. Uh, you want an Emmy, an Oscar? What are you trying to go for here? You're so full of shit, you little <laughs> You're a little <laughs> man. I can slap you up the side of your head with a backhand and knock you out, you little <laughs> Joining us now, reporter for The Washington Post, Eugene Scott, and senior columnist 
for The Daily Beast, Matt Lewis. Um, that voicemail is just so disturbing. It's hard to even yeah. It's hard to even find the words, Joe. You know, Matt, we, uh, you and I uh, both both raised conservatives. I was raised in a conservative household. Uh, uh, a lot of lot of FDR Democrats that turned Republican based on uh, a lot of the madness uh, in in the streets and the rioting and the violence in Chicago '68. I think Chicago '68, while my parents were watching the convention, was. A real turning point. Uh, and it was against the sort of chaos and the madness, the lack of respect for the law enforcement, the lack of respect for institutions, the lack of respect uh, for the U United States government that I think turned my family from Democrats to Republicans. And here we are. And as Kevin Williamson wrote in his great National Review piece, it's now the far right that's having their hippie moment. Uh, you know, uh, I always talk about, you know, Kurt Anderson uh, in, in his book, Evil Geniuses, was talking about the rise of, of the right, uh, but was also talking about, you know, how there was like a, a bombing, a left wing bombing. Uh, it seemed once a week at the end of the 1960s. And that complete madness uh, is now being uh, is now being adopted by parts of the extreme right wing. And we see it here. We see it on TV shows. We see officers being mocked and ridiculed by hosts who once claimed to be conservatives. It's it's just really crazy, Matt. I mean, this is, again, this is, it this is, is why you know, this is something so, I noticed. so many people went, again, I'm so sorry. It's why so many people in the 60s and 70s uh, became Republicans. And now... It's yeah, why so many absolutely. people are in the suburbs are going from in the same suburbs we lived in are now going from the Republican Party back to the Democratic Party. I remember you know, when Sarah Palin first hit the scene, you know, a decade ago or more, she started talking about the establishment. And it really reminded me of like 60s radicals on college campuses talking about the administration. It was and, and now I think we've come really full circle to attacking uh, police officers. Um, you know, if you watch watch these these guys, they're not like a feet liberal, you know, progressives. These are, you know, blue collar working class guys like my dad. My dad was a prison guard for 30 years. My father in law was a, a, mm. a police officer. I mean, these these were for a long time, the people that if you were a uh, a Republican or a conservative, you were brought up respecting and revering. I mean, obviously there are problems with the police. Uh, you know, we acknowledge that. I, I believe in police reform, but the idea that it would be conservatives who are, you know, bashing uh, these guys who are putting their lives on the line and women as well, uh, in many cases, it's it really is is the opposite of the kind of conservatism that we grew up with. And as you mentioned, Joe, the kind that attracted people uh, who maybe were FDR Democrats once upon a time to the Republican Party. Yeah, and it is crazy. Again, I, we, we were we were in the uh, suburbs, northern suburbs of Atlanta, Eugene, and a lot of Democrats became Republicans uh, with, uh, you know, the again, the craziness of anti-war uh protests, the violence on college campuses, the radicalism in the streets of Chicago. And now here we, here we are like 40, 50 years later. And in those same Atlanta suburbs, a lot of those converted Republicans are now going back to the Democratic Party and voting for Democrats and helping Democrats get elected senator in Georgia, two of them, and helping Democrats uh, elect Joe Biden president of the United States. It's just, it's this almost his perfect circle. Or at the very least, you know, going to the end, make, making themselves independents or self-identifying as a group that wants to be affiliated with neither party because of concerns about extremism. But one of the things I think that's really important for historical context is if you think about the 60s and you read and listen to the speeches of uh, Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, there was some warning that this pivot wasn't really or at least solely about values for everyone involved in terms of respect for government or police or America. Some of this 
this was about trying to preserve and protect uh, white supremacy, toxic masculinity, all of these ideals that we see at the core of some of these groups of people who are defending the insurrectionists on, uh, and they're attacking the U.S. Capitol. And it wasn't as huge of a pivot with all individuals as it may seem, but this is just what it looks like when you take a worldview that's really rooted in not progressing or moving forward and creating a space that's safe for everyone to its logical conclusion. You have people calling up law enforcement officers who were protecting lawmakers and other Americans and using profane language against them because they seek to uh, make America everything that those individuals in the 60s said they wanted America to be, but are now showing that they really have little interest in seeing this country become. And Eugene, you are so right. Thank you for bringing it up. Obviously, there was a big race component as well for a lot of Democrats uh, turning to the Republican Party. But you look now and, and you see even in New York City, you've got a former cop running as conservative as can be talking about going after socialists and going after disorder in the street and going after this and going after that, striking some very conservative tones. Uh, and he's a guy, Eric Adams, who won the Bronx, who mm -hmm. won Brooklyn, who won Queens, who won Staten Island, and who's sending a real message, a clear message, I think, to the Democratic Party nationally that, again, that chaos that drove a lot of people to the Republican Party in the late 60s and is driving a lot of people to vote Democratic uh, now in, the, in, in 2020 and, and beyond, Mika it's a real warning for Republicans. They, they have got to stop uh, trying to cover up the truth about January the 6th because they will be the ones who pay in the end. It's like, I, I don't know what they, what they, where they think they're going with this um, because the truth is right there. Whether it's the politics of climate change, the effects of state marijuana laws, or the challenges of racial injustice, get your daily dose of enlightening articles at MSNBC Daily. Written perspectives by people you know and trust like Alicia Menendez, tackling the issue of immigration, Mehdi Hassan, weighing in on voter suppression, and Frank Figluzzi, writing about national security, along with Michael Steele, offering his take on the Republican Party, Liz Plank, commenting on gender issues, and others. Plus, a fresh take every morning from me, Hayes Brown. Start your day with MSNBC Daily at msnbc.com.